Chapter 32 The Scope of History Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 1 to 11 At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hands. And he wrote in the tables, according to the first writing, the ten commandments which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself, and came down from the mount, and put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be, as the Lord commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth, of the children of Jachan, to Mosorah. There Aaron died, and there he was buried. And Eleazar his son ministered in the priest's office in his stead. From thence they journeyed unto Godgoda, and from Godgoda to Jotbath, a land of rivers and waters. At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. And I stayed in the mounts, according to the first time, forty days and forty nights, and the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord would not destroy thee. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swear unto their fathers to give unto them. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. In these verses, Moses continues his review of the past, but not necessarily in a chronological manner. His purpose is to give covenantal teaching. The subject of Moses' sermon from chapter 9, verse 1 to chapter 10, verse 11 can be summed up under two general subjects. First, God is a determiner of history. In Honeycutt's words, the one God prepares the way for his people, chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. Success in life is more often than not dependent upon events over which persons have had no control. In this instance, Israel was to cross the Jordan and confront those people who had prevented them from entering Kadath over forty years earlier. How could they now succeed when previously they had failed? The answer is clear and direct. Know therefore that this day that he who goes over before you is the Lord your God. Chapter 9, verse 3. Then, second, success comes often in spite of the people. It is due to God, not man. But there is a third fact related to these two that Moses stresses namely, the mercy and the forbearance of God. After the destruction of the original covenant tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments, God requires Moses to come again to the mounts with two freshly hewn tablets. It was not because God had forgiven and forgotten their evil, but because of his promise to the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, it was forbearance, not forgiveness. In preparation for the renewal of the covenant, the ark had to be built, verses 2 and 3. This means little to us because humanism has denuded the world of meaning. Law is a religious fact. Religions are differing systems of law that set forth the ultimate nature of good and the source of good. 
a covenant was a treaty of law between two parties, and two copies of a covenant were always made, one for each party. The covenant or law treaty was then housed in the temples of the contracting parties. In the case of Israel, the sanctuary was God's house or palace, as well as the people's holy place. To place God's law in the ark tells us that God, who requires this, holds that his law is central to his covenant man. To despise God's law is to despise God. So important is the law to God that, in the great renewal of the covenant with Christ, the law is to be written also in the hearts of his people. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The law is to become second nature to the redeemed. This means that antinomians are rejecting the gospel and are ignorant of the meaning of regeneration. It is the death of Aaron which is chronologically out of place here. It took place later at Mount Hor, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 50, Numbers chapter 20 verses 22 to 29. Its purpose here is to tell us that, just as the covenant was renewed, so too was the priesthood in the person of Eleazar. Verse 6 God's covenant mercy is seen also in the separation of the tribe of Levi to undertake three tasks for God. First, they are to carry the ark. Numbers chapter 3 verse 31, chapter 4 verse 15. Because the ark carried the covenant law, this made the Levites the instructors of Israel, the teachers of the law, as Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 10 tells us. In other words, God did not limit his ministry to the priests, but very specifically gave special eminence to his clerisy. Verse 8. Second, the Levites were to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, Verse 8. The priests, while having certain exclusive functions, were thus definitely not God's only servants or ministers. The Levites could not be excluded. The service of God is definitely broader than the official channels. The institutionalization of the sanctuary was thereby breached. With the coming of Christ and the Aaronic priesthood's end, the Levitical functions are now broader. Third, the order of Levites were to bless in his name. Verse 8. Again, this was normally a priestly function. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 5, Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23, Numbers 6, 23. Moses' sermons in Deuteronomy are warnings. They remind Israel of past sins that are endemic to the heart of fallen man. Man's basic or original sin is to be his own God, Genesis chapter 3 verse 5, and as a result he views himself not as a fallen man but as a God in the making, one independent of any word other than his own. Charles Simeon described this condition very ably. Man is a dependent creature. He has nothing of his own. He can do nothing. He can control no event whatever. He is altogether in the hands of God who supports him in life and accomplishes both in him and by him his own sovereign will and pleasure. Yet he affects wisdom though. He is born like a wild ass's colt and strength though he is crushed before the moth. Nay, so extraordinary is his blindness that he arrogates righteousness to him, though he is so corrupt that he has not so much as one imagination of the thought of his heart which is not evil continually. If there ever were a people that might be expected to be free from self-complacent thoughts, it must be the Israelites who were brought up out of Egypt for no people had ever had such opportunities of discovering the evil of their hearts as they had. No persons ever received such signal mercies as they, nor ever betrayed such perverseness of mind as they. 
Yet did Moses judge it necessary to caution even them not to ascribe to any merits of their own the interpretations of God in their behalf, but to trace them to their proper source. The determination of God to display in and by them his own glorious perfections. In verse 9, we are told that Levi was to have no landed inheritance. In the division of the land among the clans or tribes, Levi was to receive no farm land, only town sites. The Levites were thereby barred from depending on the land for their income. The tithes of the people were to provide their support. God's clerisy is thus freed thereby from the economic problem in order to be better enabled to learn and to teach. Calvin said of the law, By the way, we have to mark also that it is not for us to make or frame laws to serve God withal, but that we must simply bring out tables and let him write in them what he thinks good. Moses was a great and excellent prophet, and yet did not God give him leave or liberty to write anything in his tables or to put anything onto them, but restrained him altogether to the things that were written there? And they appeared well in this, in that both the tables were written, not on the one side only, but on both, even to the full, to the intent that no man living should add anything to them. Seeing then that God wrote his commandments in those two tables himself, and committed not that charge unto Moses, is it lawful for any mortal creature to add any invention of his own to God's law? You see then, the way for us to put this doctrine in use is to bear in mind that if Moses, being so excellent a man, and as an angel of God, might not write or add anything to God's law, much less may we. Wherefore, to serve God aright, let us learn that we must not take upon us to invent anything at all, nor to presume upon our own devotions, as we term them, for all such gear will be misliked but sacrifice, so as there be not anything written in us until God speak, and that we receive simply without any gainsaying whatever proceedeth out of his mouth. There is an interesting geographical reference in verse 7 to Jotbath, described as a land of rivers of waters. Nothing like that exists in the area now. We are not accustomed to thinking of lands blighted and cursed by God. We prefer to think of man as the one who can destroy the earth, a bit of humanistic arrogance. God can bless or curse a land. He can make it rich and productive or barren and dry. How far man has gone in his arrogance is clear in his notion that he can destroy the earth. God's mercy to Israel appears first, in that they are allowed to continue their wilderness journey in spite of their rebellion. Second, he allows Moses to be a mediator, interceding for the people. In this respect, Moses was again a forerunner of Christ. There is another aspect to this history that is very important. God's wrath and his mercy had a far greater concern than with Israel and that moment of history. His judgments, as well as his grace, looked beyond Israel to Christ, beyond the church to the end of time and to eternity. A persistent fallacy on man's part is to view the historical process and God's working therein in terms of the present as though all history culminates in us? The blessed fact is that it does not, and if we view the events of the day in terms of ourselves, we shall be a miserable people. But God's purposes transcend ours, and his perspective has all time and eternity in mind. <laughs> 